Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, special presentation um, of uh, Professor Duncan Williams uh, and his uh, talking about his book American Sutra, which has just uh, come out and done very well. I think it's been like in the top five of the LA Times uh, bestseller list. Um, and um, let me get his bio up. So <laughs> Duncan Ruken Williams was born in, J in Tokyo, Japan to a Japanese mother and British father. After growing up in Japan and England until age 17, he moved to the US to attend college, that's Reed College, uh, for undergraduate work, and graduate school at Harvard University, where he re received a PhD in religion. Uh, Duncan is currently professor of religion at the University of Southern California and director of the USC Shinso Ito Center for Japanese Religions and, Religions and Culture. Previously, he held the Ito Distinguished Chair of Japanese Buddhism at the University of California at Berkeley and served as the director of Berkeley's Center for Japanese Studies. He also served as executive vice president of the Japan House LA, a public diplomacy initiative of, the Jap of Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is also the author of The Other Side of Zen, a social history of Soto Zen Buddhism in Tokugawa, Japan editor of seven books, including American Buddhism, Hapa Japan, History, Identity, and Representations of Mixed Race, Mixed Roots, Japanese Peoples, and Buddhism in Ecology. Um, this is his latest book. Uh, Professor Williams is also a Zen minister. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Williams. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, uh, appreciation to everyone here at, at the San Jose Buddhist Church, Betsuin. Um, the format, I think, for today is that I'm going to speak uh, maybe 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. And then we'll have uh, Rimban uh, Gerald Sakamoto representing this temple and uh, 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 Gordon, uh, re representing the uh, at, from the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, uh, to give some brief remarks before we open it up for uh, questions. But uh, I really appreciate all of you coming. Um, this is a book that um, uh, it's taken me a little over 17 years to complete, from conception to completion. And so, you know, if you weren't, it would not. It would kind of suck if nobody uh, turned up today. So <laughs> really appreciate your taking the time on a Sunday afternoon. Um, I, I'm going to start today uh, with a few things uh, from in the news. Uh, this just happened like just yesterday and a couple, a couple days ago. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you subscribe to like Apple News or if you have news alerts on Google. Uh, I, I, I receive my news in this kind of very sporadic way where I have certain keywords. Um, uh, Dennis just mentioned a book I did called Hapa Japan, which is about mixed race Japanese people. And uh, because I'm half British and Japanese, I, I have this keyword that sends me any alerts uh, related to that very obscure topic. But I get a lot of uh, little news bits here and there. And then also because of this book, uh, things related to the World War II Japanese American um, incarceration experience or internment, like there's different keywords, uh, Google sends me all these news bits. And uh, just in the last couple of days, these two concerns of mine kind of collided. Uh, and I found two news articles that, that, that kind of surprised me in the way in which uh, I think, I hope I can uh, by the end of the talk. At the beginning, it's going to seem a little bit disparate and what is Duncan doing? But it'll, it'll all come together by the end, I promise. But I found this news article about this 95-year-old man you see on this slide um, participating in a march called Love Not Hate in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Now, I think many of you know that on March 15th, there was a, you know, true. Uh, tremendously devastating attack 
on uh, two different mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, by a so-called white Christian nationalist um, who was both anti-Muslim and anti kind of white, non-white people living in both New Zealand and Australia. And, uh, you know, of course, that has this longer history in Australia. The man was Australian, called the White Australia Policy, about immigration and how to keep uh, Australia a white nation. And so he brought that kind of very particular point of view uh, in his attack on these uh, uh, mosques in New Zealand. And this man, this 95-year-old World War II veteran, uh, turned up at this rally in which he had to take four buses to get there. He, his name is John Sato. He's like me, half Japanese and half British. But during World War II, served as one of the two people in the uh, New Zealand uh, armed forces with the Allies uh, you know, there's only two people, you know, unlike the Japanese American 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, uh, that was a segregated unit in the U.S. Army of people of uh, Japanese uh, uh, ancestry. In New Zealand, there's only two people of Japanese ancestry who served during World War II, and he was one of them. And apparently, the day after the mosque's attack, he felt, he seems like, I couldn't sleep. And, and he felt like he needed to do something. He's, he turns up at a vigil in his suburb um, near Auckland and then uh, to, to show his support. And they tell him, tell, tell him that there's a big rally happening in downtown Auckland. And, he, and he, he's a 95-year-old, but takes four buses to get there. And when he finally gets there, he's late for the rally. But one protester and one policeman <laughs> kind of help him walk on this rally. So that came in on my news feed for like people, mixed race Japanese people, right? <laughs> and then this other one came in. Um, it, 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 it was related to a project um, called Tsuru for Solidarity. And I think if you know ja the word in Japanese, Tsuru is like a crane. And there's a tradition uh, to when you, when you want to kind of ask for peace in the world uh, and unity to, to fold out of origami or other paper some paper cranes. And a group uh, or a, a several groups, uh, including here in the San Francisco Bay Area, in LA, Seattle, Sacramento, uh, these groups got together to uh, fold 10,000 cranes, 150 boxes of cranes were uh, folded and sent to Texas. As part of, again, this is my other keyword for you know the, the Japanese American World War II incarceration. It, it, it was it was a group intending to go uh, on this pilgrimage, as many uh, Japanese American uh, people do, uh, but to Crystal City, one of the lesser known of the uh, World War II camps in Texas, and this group went down to Crystal City. Uh, uh, the former site of the enemy alien detention center, uh, and then went on to this place uh, that you see on the slide in uh, Dilly, Texas, the South Texas Residential Family Center. And back in World War II, Crystal City was one of those camps where people who had been separated as families uh, could reunite. It was called a family reunification camp. So if you're, for example, if your father had been taken away by the FBI right after Pearl Harbor uh, and the family wanted to get together again, sometimes that happened in one of the 10 big war relocation authority camps. But uh, in many cases, it happened here in this uh, place right outside of San Antonio called Crystal City. And so they were on their pilgrimage, but they also made a further pilgrimage to this detention center, which uh, holds roughly 2,400 uh, women and children separated uh, from their fathers, uh, just like in World War II. Um, and I think, as many of you know, in terms of this country's immigration policy, uh, so-called zero tolerance, uh, the uh, Health and Human Services have identified 
2,737 children uh, separated right now as we speak uh, from their families. So uh, this is obviously happening at the southern border. So these two immigration type of stories and about certain kinds of ideas about who is allowed in and out of somewhere like New Zealand or Australia, but also here in the United States. These came into my news feeds. And um, by the end of the talk, I, I hope you'll, you'll see where I'm, what I'm trying to talk about. But uh, I wanted to just start with those little pieces of news uh, before I talk about this book, which I mentioned is something that took me 17 uh, plus years to write. Um, it all um, began some, uh, it was just right after I fit, had finished my PhD dissertation. And uh, I know she's in the room here today, uh, Shirley, uh, the sister of my professor at that time, Professor Masatoshi Nagatomi. He had been, in 1958, the first uh, professor of Buddhist studies appointed at Harvard University. And I'm not that old, so I'm, I'm turning 50 this year, but I'm not that old. So I was one, one of his last students. And in fact, I had just finished my PhD and I was about to turn into, uh, when, he, when he unfortunately uh, suddenly passed away. And, you know, as uh, Dennis mentioned, I, I was born in Tokyo to a Japanese mom and British father. So I have no family connection uh, to the Japanese American World War II uh, uh, period history. But it was when my professor at Harvard, Masatoshi Nagatomi, passed away, and his wife asked me to help her uh, clear out his office. Uh, I think the idea was to donate his amazing collection of Buddhist studies books uh, to a, an academic library of some kind. And by the way, it's actually here in the San Francisco Bay Area in Berkeley at the Institute for Buddhist Studies, the Nagatomi collection there. But she wanted me to pull out anything that looked personal, that had Japanese you know, letters or writing. You know, and, and, and so I was doing that. And when I came across what you see on this screen, this is one page of it. It had the name Nagatomi on it, but it wasn't, I could tell my professor's handwriting, and it wasn't his. And what I would come to learn was that it was his father's, uh, a Buddhist priest's handwriting, Reverend Shinjo Nagatomi, who you see pictured here uh, on the slide. And uh, it was his World War II uh, diary, as well as notes that he took. He gave sermons every Sunday, and he took notes to himself about what he would say. And, and, and there it was in my professor's office, kind of stuck on, in the midst of like, drafts of a PhD dissertation and other correspondence. It was something that he obviously valued and couldn't throw out, uh, but also it wasn't something that he had mentioned to anybody, including his wife. And so when I brought this document from World War II written behind barbed wire in Manzanar to his wife, uh, my professor's wife, she, she asked me to, to, to translate some of it uh, uh, for her. Uh, she was, unlike my professor, born in the US, in Madera, California, and, and uh, she was a Nisei and, 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 and could speak Japanese quite you know, well and so forth, but, 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 but couldn't read some, some of the writing was a little bit difficult, so she asked me to translate bits and pieces of it, and that's when I had to kind of take a crash course in Japanese American World War II history because I, I didn't really know anything. And what is a mess hall? What is, you know, all these things I didn't know. So I had to, had to learn something. And, um, but I, I never thought of writing a whole book about this and taking, you know, years of my life in the National Archives, interviewing 120 uh, people. I, I, I translated uh, many kind of diaries and sermons and, and so forth for the book. I would never have done it if she hadn't told me her family story. And as, as I said, she's from Madera, California, and uh, she told me what happened during that period in World War II, uh, uh, to, to what, what she experienced uh, as a 10-year-old girl at that time. And so this is, she begins by telling me what happened when a few you know, it was a little bit after Pearl Harbor, December uh, of 1941, when she comes home from school one day to her home, this farm, 
in, in Madeira, and she sees her father being beaten by some men in suits at the, at the front of the house, and she peers into the house, and at the kitchen table, sitting very still, is her mother with somebody pointing a shotgun to her head. And now she's only 10 years old, and you know it's a frightening situation, but she knows she has to step in. And she told me that, you know, her parents from Wakayama Prefecture, they come, you know, had this farm, but they don't speak a lot of English. And clearly these men in suits, whom she would come to learn were FBI agents, didn't speak Japanese. So she'd have to translate for them. And apparently what had happened as she was translating was that just before these FBI agents arrived, there were some rabbits in the lettuce field or something, and her dad had a shotgun and was trying to scare them off. But unfortunately, that was the precise moment when these FBI agents had arrived at the house. And that's what caused the scene. And so once everything was explained and everything calmed down, the FBI agents you know, told them why they were there. And apparently, it was because her dad was a prominent member of the Madeira Buddhist Temple's uh, like temple board. Like, you know, at this, you know, at this uh, San Jose Buddhist Church, you, there's also a temple board, right? He was, he was a prominent member of the board. And because of that, he was on an FBI list of people to be interrogated. Now, the Buddhist priests, some of them have already been taken by these days and weeks after Pearl Harbor. Uh, but this is, he's not a priest. He's just a lay average person. But he was still on a list because of his affiliation with the Buddhist temple. And so it would, it would come to be that uh, uh, that day the FBI agents left and, and uh, uh, they, would, they would come to uh, uh, the house later a number of uh, more times in the weeks that followed. Uh, but what I wanted to start off with today was this idea of Buddhism as a national security threat. The idea that these FBI agents had lists of people to be interrogated, lists of people to be arrested in case of war with Japan. And indeed, what I found in my research as I was trying to find out more about what is a Buddhist priest diary from a camp, what, what does it mean, and why were Buddhists, you know, I was trying to find out more, and I found out in the National Archives that the very first person arrested after the Pearl Harbor attack, even before the smoke had cleared, at 3 p.m. that day, even before the 3.30 declaration of martial law, was Bishop Gikyo Kuchiba, same sect temple as this one here, uh, but the big temple in Honolulu. He was the first person arrested. Second person arrested, also a Buddhist priest. And you'd think like, well, maybe consular officials, or like, like why, why Buddhist priests? And it turned out, as I was doing these years of research in the archives, that the Office of Naval Intelligence, Army G2, and the FBI all were coordinated prior to the war in surveillance of Buddhist temples, making of these lists of registries, and, 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 and strategies for what to do in case of war uh, with Japan. So while the Pearl Harbor attack was indeed a surprise, because most intelligence agencies and assessments had thought the attack would come on the Philippines, uh, the plan was already in place for what to do, how to declare martial law, how to shut down uh, newspapers or Japanese language radio stations, uh, and how to arrest uh, leaders in the community, um, uh, including uh, Buddhist priests who were targeted by these intelligence agencies as a particular threat to national security. Of the 230 some Buddhist priests who served uh, temples all across the United States in December of 1941, uh, you know, uh, 70, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 70 some percent of, of the Buddhist priests were taken right away, either on the day of Pearl Harbor or in the days that followed. Um, uh, if you were a Shinto priest, you were 100% taken away. And if you're a Christian minister, you had a 17% chance of being taken away. Which meant that 
in the minds of the American authorities at that time, there was a gradation of threat assessment depending on religion. And so that's what my book is about, is, 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 this, is about the role that, because there are a lot of books out there about the World War II Japanese American incarceration and internment, uh, but not too many that look at not just why it all happened around like race and national origin, but, but looking at, at religion and how that mattered as well. Now, back to my professor's wife's family, the Kimura family in, in Madera, California. For them, the way they experienced these arrests of the priests and their interrogation, the dad was like, you know what, we have to, in this time of war with Japan, our ancestral home, we have to show that, you know, our daughters, you know, American citizens, like, we have to show our loyalty to this country. And just, to, just because we are Buddhist doesn't mean, you know, we're disloyal. And so one of the tasks or chores that uh, the 10-year-old Masumi had was lighting the, like, like the, at that time, they, to build the Japanese-style ofuro or bath, they would use firewood. And so that was one of her chores, kind of putting the firewood on. And so she didn't think much of it when her dad asked her to do that. But he was like, we have to show our loyalty. And we're going to do it by burning away things that have anything that has like made in Japan or kanji, Japanese characters on it. And for her, as a 10-year-old girl, the worst thing was he brought her entire Hinamatsuri Ningyo, the Girl's Day doll set and threw that into the fire as well. But then he hesitated. He had one more thing he was going to, he had one more set of papers he was going to throw into the fire, and he just couldn't get himself to do so. And he, he, would, he, he then asked his wife, could you find some old kimono to kind of safe, you know, wrap it in, and then an then, uh, uh, old senbe, like a rice cracker tin box, to put these documents in. And for 10-year-old Masumi, she was like, you know, what could be more important than my dolls, right? <laughs> and so he explained that, you know, he, one document was a sutra, a, a, a Buddhist scripture, a sacred text that had been handed down generation by generation in his family. He couldn't, he just couldn't get himself to kind of put that in the fire. And also because he was on the board of the Madera Buddhist temple, he had all the minutes of the board meetings from the founding and establishment of the temple all up to December 41. And he's like, I can't, this is not mine for me to just burn. So he goes out, takes the backhoe, digs a hole right near a large tree next to the garage and places that rice cracker tin box in the ground containing a Buddhist scripture, a sutra, the teachings of the Buddha and the history of, of, of this uh, uh, Madera Buddhist temple, hoping one day that they could retrieve it. Now this story for me is about one family who in the face of, you know, society's look on them saying, you know, are you a threat to us? They, they were like, okay, look, we're willing to burn away our Japanese-ness but we're not willing to burn away our faith, our Buddhist faith. And so that's what I want to talk about some more today is because for me, this book, American Sutra, is about this fundamental question. Can you be both a Buddhist and an American at the same time? It was a, it was a live question back in December 41. And I'm going to argue later, coming back to those slides at the beginning, we have these type of questions about race, religion, and American belonging, who is included, who is excluded. These questions are actually still relevant for us today. And that's some lessons to learn from what Buddhist families went through during World War II. Now, I think most of you, I, I, this is the kind of audience, you know, when I'm in the American South or uh, on the, even on the East Coast, sometimes I have to explain, explain more, but I think most people here already know that in February 1942, uh, it was not just the roundup of community leaders, but after the issuance of Executive Order 9066, 
uh, by President Roosevelt, that there was a mass incarceration of everyone on, of Japanese ancestry on the Pacific coast or the west coast of the United States from the Western uh, Defense Command Zone. And, you know, people had usually, uh, these notices went up after the executive order. The, the Army had the discretion to decide who they would uh, uh, remove from militarily sensitive areas. And they put up signs that talked about people of Japanese ancestry. And you were given usually a week or 10 days or something to, you know, do something with your life. You had to, if you're a college student, maybe you had to disenroll. If you were, you know, you had to sell your business or farm or store what you could. Because what they were, uh, uh, what you were told was that you could take what you could carry. Which for most families meant like a single suitcase. So suddenly, the government is telling you, you can no longer live in your home. You got you to gotta move somewhere for a time indefinite and a place unknown. And you can take what you can carry. So what, you know, like what, if you were told that today, suddenly, what would you do in your apartment or house and figure out what would you take in that one suitcase? So people, I think, at that time were urgently trying to deal with these practical matters of selling things, storing things, packing that suitcase. But they must have also asked themselves, why us? Why are we being targeted like this? You know, the United States was also at war with Germany and Italy. And there was no mass incarceration of all German Americans or all Italian Americans. So why us? And the chief architect of the mass incarceration, uh, Lieutenant General John DeWitt gives something of an answer. In his 1943 final report about the whole forced removal and incarceration. And he frames it in terms of what he calls mili the military necessity, that's his words, and again, this is his words, uh, of a community that was a, this, again, not me saying it, he's saying a menace that had to be dealt with because it was a large, unassimilated, tightly knit racial group bound to an enemy nation by strong ties of race, culture, custom, and religion. At that time, the Japanese American community on the West Coast, this is even bigger in, the, in Hawaii, but on the West Coast, two thirds of whom were US citizens, but over two thirds of whom were Buddhists, was being conflated in the minds of the US military as a threat, not only because of their race, but as John DeWitt says, because also their religion. This roundup of everybody on the West Coast, I think everybody knows about it, but perhaps we haven't reflected how thorough that forced removal and incarceration was. The, the DeWitt's uh, kind of, uh, right-hand man, one of the other people involved in the, in the kind of uh, roundup, Colonel Carl Bendiston, he says something very instructive as well. Apparently he was asked, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an orphanage down in LA uh, run by the Marinals, and, and, and he was asked by uh, one of the leaders of the Catholic uh, uh, orphanage, you know, we have here in our orphanage kids, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, some mixed-race babies, you know, do we, are they also subject to the executive order and subject to being taken away into some camp? And his reply was, uh, this is his words, if they have a single drop of Japanese blood in them, I want them in camp. So that's how thorough it was. It didn't matter if you were a U.S. citizen or not, if you're actually capable of espionage or sabotage or not, if you're a little baby or an infirm grandmother or not. It was, as General DeWitt said, the conflation of race, culture, and religion and what they viewed as the resultant uh, threat and unassimilability of that community that made them uh, a national security threat. Now, I just wanted to show, you know, once, once these orders went up, 
people reported to a so-called civil control station. There are 108 of them up and down the West Coast. Uh, in this photo you see, in this slide you see uh, uh, one of them in Los Angeles. It's today where the Japanese American National Museum is uh, located on First Street. It was where the old uh, Nishonganji Jibetsuin temple, Buddhist temple, uh, was. But that was one of the 108 places uh, that people went to. And then they would be sent to uh, I think euphemistically at titled places uh, called assembly centers uh, where people would stay in the summer and fall of 42 until the more permanent uh, war relocation authority camps were being built. And here uh, you know in many of these places like Santa Anita in Los Angeles or Tamferan or you know in this region or Portland or this is this fo photo is of Puyallup uh, it's about 35 miles south of, of, of Seattle fairgrounds uh, uh, horse race tracks uh, many people found that they had that suitcase they were taken to places that not many weeks ago were horse stalls with the stench of manure barely concealed by the wooden floors uh, just laid on the ground. And they were treated by their government as if they were little more than cattle. And in the midst of that, families tried to, you know, regain a sense of dignity, a sense semblance of normalcy as they unpacked those suitcases. But among the first U.S. Army policies in the Assembly Center was a new rule that banned the Japanese language. It deemed any publication written in Japanese as contraband to be confiscated, and further prohibited any group meetings uh, that might have any Japanese language content. So practically, what this meant was that if you, for example, had, like the Kimura family, a, a Buddhist sutra, or, uh, or even like a book of Japanese poetry, that was contraband. You know, and Buddhist services, you know, you would chant in Japanese or the service would be a hybrid of English and Japanese. So they were practically unable to gather. The only exemption to the Army's new policy of, of having something in your possession in Japanese, they, they made two, two exceptions. One was the Christian Bible, if it was in Japanese, and an English-Japanese language dictionary. So in other words, Japanese language pr was permitted by the U.S. Army as long as it aided in the promotion of Christian conversion and speaking the English language. And to me, this reflected a presumption so prevalent at the time of an Anglo-Protestant normativity to which immigrants were urged to adopt, if not possible on racial grounds, at least on the level of language and religion. But I want to ask us to look at this slide here. Because whatever the government might have thought was dangerous, confiscated as contraband, it could not so easily take what people held in their hearts. In this slide, we see the Terakawa family and their new home in the Assembly Center, Portland's International Livestock and Expo Center. They had transformed a former horse stable into a more livable space with what they had brought, trying to find some dignity in those degrading conditions. But in addition to rebuilding their lives in the new physical space, they also made space for their spiritual life. And putting their faith on display, what we see here, this is uh, Reverend Tansai Terakawa. He, was, he served the Oregon Buddhist Church before the war. We see his daughter Hiroko playing checkers with her friend Lillian Hayashi. But under a, a photo of the Buddha and a large American flag, quietly but firmly questioning the government's view that only Christians could be considered true Americans. This is one family's way of saying, you know what, we can be both 100% Buddhist and 100% American at the same time. Now, once people moved to the war relocation camps, rules started to ease up a little bit because the WRA was run by a civilian agency and not uh, by the U.S. Army, uh, but they still had to create their lives anew, create their Buddhism 
uh, anew. For example, in one camp, and actually this was in one of the one of the uh, uh, Department of Justice camps, uh, one of the first ways that Buddhists tried to revive their Buddhist faith, because you know, if you can imagine, if you're in a if you're in a state of dislocation, you've just been forcibly removed, you're in a state of lost, you've just lost everything you've worked for decades prior to the war, your farm, your business, like you've lost it. So in a state of dislocation, loss, and, and, and people wanted to draw on their faith and their Buddhism to help orient themselves in this very difficult time. And so as they were doing that, the first big ceremony that comes up is the Buddha's birthday in April. So, you know, people taken uh, uh, in the earth, as I said, sometimes on the day of Pearl Harbor, all the way up to this, you know, into the spring and summer of 42. But for those taken early, the big first ceremony is in April. Uh, I think at this temple, you do the same thing, right? In April, it's called Hanamatsuri, it's the Buddha's birthday. Hanamatsuri means han flower matsuri or festival. It's called that because the Buddha's birthday in legend, you know, the Buddha's born, um, and it's said that the heavens were, by legend, the heavens were so pleased and happy that the Buddha was born that it rained flowers and, 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 and Dharma rain or kind of rain from, sweet rain from the skies. And so in a typical Buddha's birthday ceremony, what you do is you have a baby Buddha statue and you pour sweet tea on the baby Buddha. But in this camp, they didn't have sweet tea and they didn't have a baby Buddha statue. So what did they do? They had some army ration sugar and coffee. So they made some sweet coffee. Arthur Yamabe, apparently, he was a good, skilled at carving things. So he went to the mess hall and found the largest carrot that he could find and carved a, a Buddha statue out of it. And so there, they used the sweet coffee pouring over the carrot Buddha. Now, I wanted to bring this example up uh, because I know the Nishira family also here, here today. Uh, and those of you who know the history of this temple know that it was built by the Nishira brothers. But uh, uh, in this slide, you see one of the Nishira, uh, and you know, there, there was a whole group of them in Heart Mountain, skilled carpenters, skilled craftsmen who uh, would try to revive Buddhist life in camp by making shumidan and uh, Buddhist altars of their, and then smaller, you know, bigger and smaller uh, altars. And, and you can see, you know, uh, sometimes they had help bringing in wood from the outside, but they also used scraps of wood that they found in the desert, uh, uh, wood that came from the mess hall packaging, uh, like, you know, today I think we, 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 we see produce and so on in cardboard boxes, but it was like in wooden crates at that time. And so they would take any wood that they could find and craft things, craft Buddhism uh, to help people have some sense of order and direction and normalcy in camp. The other thing you see in this slide is a, is a in a different camp, a, a Buddhist priest who wanted to have a ojuzu, like you know, a, like a prayer bead, a Buddhist kind of prayer bead. He, he, they had a, in that camp a ration of one piece of fruit per week. It was one run by the Department of Justice. And he kept the peach pits until he collected enough to make one of those. So that's how people tried to make do with, with what, 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 what they had. I sometimes um, use this image. A friend of mine painted this for me the other day. Um, it, 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 it is a famous Buddhist metaphor uh, or imagery called the lotus blossom that rises above muddy waters. And the way the metaphor works is that the muddy waters is the world of you know, suffering, the world of hatred and the world of delusion and the, the kind of difficult world. But that, and, and then the flower, the lotus flower, it always represents the Buddha and the Buddha's enlightenment, awakening, liberation. And the idea is that 
you know, however difficult your circumstances are, you can kind of rise up and blossom with the Buddhist way above it all. But one of the most interesting things I, I, I discovered as I was doing this research was that some people took this metaphor uh, a little bit differently. Instead of just thinking about trying to, how do you, how do you, you know, when, you're, when your freedoms have been taken away, how do you find some kind of freedom, right? If, you're, if you've been put in a horse stall, how do you find some kind of semblance of normalcy? When your freedom's been taken away, how do you still find liberation? This is actually a very Buddhist question. And among the first uh, uh, documents I, I, I looked at, it was, it, was, it was written by a Buddhist priest who, had been, who was arrested on the day of Pearl Harbor, which some of you may know, uh, December 7th was a Sunday. So he was in the midst of doing his Buddhist you know, message on Sunday when the FBI arrived. And they took him without even letting him go to his home and you know, pack a suitcase of clothes and so forth. So on the Buddha's birthday, April 1942, he was in charge of the sermon then. And his sermon that day re referenced this metaphor. And he said, you know what? My robes, I've been, I haven't had a change of clothes since December. So they're you know, pretty dirty. But in the midst of this dirtiness, these robes, in the midst of this dusty world, we're behind barbed wire, our freedom's been taken away, but it doesn't mean that our hearts have to be broken. It doesn't mean that we can't find at least a spiritual liberation, freedom, uh, in the midst of all of this. Uh, another Buddhist priest in a different camp, this is in Camp Livingston, Louisiana, left a note like this in his form of Buddhism. It's, it, he was the head priest at Khoisan Buddhist Temple in Los Angeles. Uh, in Shingon Buddhism, they have a meditation where uh, symbolically the moon is like the lotus flower. It's a, it's a symbol of enlightenment. And they practice this form of meditation where they fill their minds with enlightenment or they move the moon through their minds. And for this man, he was in this camp and upset at the fact that in his particular camp, it was a higher security camp than the WRA camps, and they would have, you know, at night, if they wanted to go to the bathroom, they have to uh, get out of their barrack, shout, you know, the guards would stop them, they'd have to say in a loud voice, prisoner, and then they were allowed to go to the bathroom. And then he would complain about that, and he would complain about these lights, guards, you know, tower searchlights going through his room, uh, uh, even at, in the middle of the night. But then he came to this realization. It's like that lotus flower above the muddy waters. He said, if you read this thing on the slide, he says, as if trying to practice meditation under the moonlit pine, I had been viewing the guard's searchlights as the Buddha's sacred light and had been practicing komyo meditation together with Kobodaishi. So he uses his difficult karmic circumstance, and instead of being defeated by it, somehow he uses it and employs it to find his own path, some direction, some meaning at a, light, at, at a time when uh, life was so, uh, had been turned upside down. You know, especially for the families that uh, lost people that first uh, winter and spring in 42-43 uh, um, the, the sense of loss and disorientation and difficulty was compounded so they've lost everything they work for you know they're in these camps and then suddenly uh, this is the other area that Buddhism really played a big role in the early days of the camp was when families suddenly lost young babies or the elderly, especially these war relocation authority camps, the tar paper barracks, they weren't necessarily built that well, and so they had holes in the, and so that first winter, quite a few of the frail in the community passed away. And for the, those families, uh, having a Buddhist priest perform a funeral, a memorial service, something, something so that these people's lives would not be 
forgotten was a really important part of of uh, of what Buddhism meant, why it was important for these families. I mentioned Shirley Okabe is in the audience here today, uh, and her father, uh, Reverend Shinjo Nagatomi, my you know my professor's uh, father, was in Manzanar, and uh, he had to perform so many funerals and memorial services uh, those first months, and. He was determined in 1943 to make sure that those people whose bones and ashes were at the cemetery at Manzanar uh, would not be neglected, would not be forgotten. And he, and he, he was part of a very important effort to, to try to build something. And in fact, you see it here in this slide, the ireto, to means monument. Ide, you know, to honor the day, the spirits, the spirits of those who just passed, as well as the spirits of the ancestors. And he went around barrack to barrack asking families five cents per family, ten cents per family, even if your family didn't experience a loss of a of, of someone in, in in the family, he would ask them, plead with them to 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 donate to buy the concrete necessary to build this monument. And it's his handwriting. Ireto, you know, it, it's like uh, he talks about in his diary that, you know, he didn't want to mess it up because, you know, once you put it on concrete, you can't really change it. So he practiced again and again until he felt like the kanji characters were just right. And that's what's on the monument. And, and that the monument is still there today if you go to Manzanar, and built in time for the summer Obon of 43. He wanted to, you know, when people pass away in the Buddhist tradition, they have a special kind of attention called Nibong, the first Obon after somebody dies. He wanted to build it in time for August of 43 when they would hold an Obon ceremony and Obon dance. And, but he also knew that people who died weren't just Buddhists, and so it was an interfaith effort. He asked, I mean, the, 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 the architect who built it was a Catholic, you know, architect who designed the monument. He asked a Protestant minister to come when it was first dedicated to co-dedicate it with him. So that all the three different groups of Japanese religions at that time, Catholic, Protestant, and Buddhist, uh, were involved in the in in the in the celebration of this monument. The concrete itself was set and built by the YBA, the Young Buddhist Association of San Pedro, but it was an interfaith effort. And if you look at this slide, and you can read the Japanese, it says Manzana Bukyokai Bomodori, 1943, August the 15th people turned up. Thousands of people turned up. Uh, even though they knew that their government viewed this kind of Japanese, Buddhist, and cultural activity as a, as a somewhat un-American type of thing, people were, by 43, because of those people who died, they, they couldn't just neglect them. Right? They, they, they couldn't just, because the government was just willing to just, you know, not care that these people had passed, but they were willing to stand up for what they thought was their right as Americans to say, we can be both Buddhist and American at the same time. We can demonstrate that publicly. So to me, the, this is a photo of Manzanar, but on the, uh, your top left, it, that's similar, thousands of people, Heart Mountain, Wyoming, uh, Amache, Colorado, below that other photo. The, people turned up in the thousands. Uh, to to assert this claim of belonging. This was all done while the government still had uh, uh, a kind of difficult relationship with Buddhism. On the one hand, by 43, they had to admit that these tri-faiths, Buddhism, the majority religion, but also Protestantism and Catholicism were 
a part of the you know spiritual and religious lives of Japanese Americans, and that because the President Roosevelt had talked about the fight against Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and the military militarism of Japan as a fight for democracy and a fight for the four freedoms, including the freedom of religion, it'd be too ironic to deny religious freedom in these camps. But at the same time, 43 was also the year, I think most many of you may know, the so-called loyalty questionnaire, or more accurately, the leave clearance form that assessed somebody's so-called loyalty from the government's point of view by asking a series of questions. The most well-known being question 27 and 28, one asking about uh, whether one would be willing to forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan, the other asking about willingness to serve in the US military. And if you answered the wrong way, according to the government, no on any of those questions, you were segregated out from your community and sent to a so-called segregation camp called Tudor Lake. So people know about 27, 28. People know less about question 16, which is about religion. And if you answered Christian on that, the government had a point system, and they would give you plus two points. If you answered Buddhist on that, you got minus one point. If you answered Shinto on that, you got zero. You were actually banned from leave clearance. <laughs> it always amazed me because, like, if you were an actual spy and saboteur, you'd probably just answer Christian. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it didn't make any sense. But anyway, so but but the government had, in other words, even though they allowed religious freedoms to a certain extent. They still had this gradation of like who was more properly an American, who could be counted on to be loyal, and uh, religion still played a role even in uh, uh, during the war. It's not just before the war, but during the war, and and in fact as part of resettlement and and leave clearance. I want to end today with this um, with a poem, and I'm going to try to wrap it all together. Uh, I promise. Um, the, the, there's a, the book starts, my book starts with a poem by this Buddhist priest, Zen Buddhist priest called Nyogen Senzaki. And uh, this is a picture of him giving some Buddhist talks in Heart Mountain, Wyoming, a uh, sketch uh, by Estelle Ishigo. But this is his poem that, that's, that, that begins the book American Sutra. And let me just read it, and then let me try to explain why I'm trying to end this way. The poem reads, Thus have I heard. The army ordered all Japanese faces to be evacuated from the city of Los Angeles. This homeless monk has nothing but a Japanese face. He stayed here 13 springs, meditating with all faces from all parts of the world, and studied the teaching of Buddha with them. Wherever he goes, he may form other groups, inviting friends of all faces, beckoning them with the empty hands of Zen. You know, let me keep you here. So this poem was written by, as I said, this Nyogen Senzaki, who had a Buddhist community in Los Angeles before the war. As he says in the poem, he had had it for 13 years. It wasn't just Japanese Americans, but other uh, uh, ethnicities that participated in his Buddhist group. And he's writing a poem. If you look at this at the bottom, it says the title of the poem is Parting, and he writes it May of 1942. So he's one of the Buddhist priests that wasn't picked up in that early roundup, right? And he's about to part or leave uh, Los Angeles and go to. Santa Anita to Horstall and later to Heart Mountain, Wyoming. But he begins this poem with this phrase, thus have I heard. It's a phrase attributed by legend to one of the Buddha's disciples, Ananda, who he was supposed to be this monk who had an amazing memory. And after the Buddha died, since they hadn't written down any of the Buddha's sermons, they had to rely on Ananda's memory and he would recite all of the Buddha's discourses, but he would always preface it with, thus have I heard. Just saying like, I mean, I, I'm hoping I'm remembering that's what I heard. 
And so a classic Buddhist sutra or a scripture always begins with that line, Evam me suttam, thus have I heard. But here, Senzaki writes a poem employing this classic preamble, but the Buddhist lesson, the teaching, because usually what follows thus have I heard is some kind of Buddhist message, some teaching of the Buddha. This is not a lesson that's called from an Indic past, but from, inspired from an American present. He says, you know, this homeless monk has nothing but a Japanese face, highlighting his exclusion from America. And reflecting on his forcible relocation through the lens of his religion, Senzaki ends up writing a new Buddhist scripture, an American sutra inspired by the terrible circumstances of his time, like that muddy water of that lotus flower. And he, but then he ends this poem in a very interesting way. He says, wherever he goes, you know, he as a Buddhist person may form other groups, inviting friends of all faces, beckoning them with the empty hands of Zen. So to me, this poem is not just about, you know, what happens during World War II when a new American Buddhism gets created in the crucible of war, uh, forced removal and incarceration, but it actually opens up a new vision of America itself. The Buddha taught that identity is neither permanent nor disconnected from uh, the realities of other identities. And from this vantage point, if we take that analysis and look at something like America as a country, then America is a nation that is constantly evolving, a nation of becoming, its composition and character constantly transformed by migrations from many corners of the world. Its promise made manifest not by an assertion of a singular or supremacist racial or religious identity, but by the recognition of the interconnected realities of a complex of peoples, cultures, foods, and religions that can enrich everyone. What I try to do in the book is therefore some, it's, it's to open up a dialogue about how faith in both Buddhism and in America can contribute to a vision of the nation that, that values uh, multiplicity, manyness over singularity, hybridity over purity, and inclusion or inclusivity over exclusivity. And the stories of the World War II Japanese American Buddhist families attempting to, you know, remember that Terracotta family with the flag and the Buddhist, these people who try to marry those things to build a free America. Not a Christian nation alone, but a nation of religious freedom. Their stories don't constitute a final analysis or answer to anything, but they do teach us something about the dynamics of becoming, what it means to become American, and also what it means to become Buddhist as part of an interconnected and dynamically shifting world. And their lives, their stories, constitute an American sutra. Thus have I heard. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Williams. Um, you know, I think this bit of history has always been there. And uh, I thank and credit him a lot for telling the story. It's a different narrative of Japanese history and Japanese American Buddhist history and something I think we all benefit from, um, especially in this day and age. Uh, we're gonna have a couple people to talk about their reactions to uh, Professor Williams' talk. First, uh, Rimbun Jiro Sakamoto. Head Minister here. I want to first of all uh, thank Professor Williams uh, for this uh, extraordinary work. Um, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast to document something that you worked with for 17 years is truly remarkable. And the story that it tells and, and 
reveals to us, I think is important uh, to us uh, as human beings, uh, not just Americans, not just Buddhists, but as human beings, that when we strip away language, when we strip away culture, when we strip away religion, we reduce the other to something non-human. And when we are able to do that, we can disregard the needs of those people. So the story that Professor Williams reveals to us, many of us know. It's in here that people came to seek refuge after being released from incarceration. Across the street where Abiko Sensei used to have his apartment was a hostel that was built. The second story was then added to it to accommodate more people. Uh, our annex building next door used to have, we, got, we have to find it again. Some, we misplaced the plaque that acknowledges Reverend Kumata as a person who worked to build uh, that, uh, that building. And Kumata Sensei is uh, an individual who was, a, I guess, one of the early Nisei Buddhist priests who spoke enough English that was able to kind of move things along. Uh, so all of these events that occur in this time period that can raise our guess, raise our awareness, and maybe our anger for what took place in that time. But we need to remember that this which occurred in this time is happening now. And it, I mean, it's obvious. It's kind of like talking about uh, talking at a funeral service. We talk about all of the wonderful things that are happening, and sometimes we're encouraged to say, acknowledge that, and we have to move on. And sometimes we are encouraged to do that. To you know, things will get better. Uh, it's important that we kind of take time to take in the importance of what has happened to us in the past but it's also necessary to carry that with us as we move into the future. There are two Supreme Court cases. Both of them have been decided, and this is just recently. In one case, a person on death row, someone who was scheduled to be executed, was not allowed to have a religious clergyman, a clergy there with him. And the execution was allowed to proceed. In the other case, the person again petitioned uh, to have a religious person present, and in this case, and was, was denied that, and in this case, the execution was stayed. I mentioned these two cases because it's now, it's relevant now today, it's happening now in this time. One was a Buddhist and one was a Muslim, right? When we strip away the culture and language and religion, we make the other not human. And in, it is then possible to do whatever we feel like we can put them away, not think about them. Buddhism is really simple. Buddhism is about recognizing, acknowledging that we don't see things as they are. We see things through our preferences, our prejudices, our likes and dislikes. And when we do that, we divide the world up. And it makes possible the separation of individuals who are not able to defend themselves or not able to wield the power to, to change the course of events. People who are unable to fend for themselves to be disregarded, whether it's homelessness in our streets, whether it's the separation and incarceration of peoples, that when we cannot see them as human beings, we can easily do these things. There is a 
someone else, and there are a lot of people that are mentioned in this book, and I, you know, I, as I'm reading through this, I started out uh, putting post-it notes in it, and, uh, but I, I ran out of post-it notes. Uh, and uh, people that I recognize, uh, people whose names, that, and, and this goes back uh, to Imamuras and Amatsuras out of um, Guadalupe, uh, in, um, Sam, uh, who eventually become uh, come to Berkeley and who, uh, whose relatives or descendants are teachers of mine, uh, the Imamuras. Jane Imamura was a Matsuda and she was the wife of a bishop uh, in Hawaii that I served under, whose name I received, my Buddhist name, I received from Kamo Imamura. And that Kan is the same Kan that is a part of my Kan Dio, uh, Kan Go uh, Imamura, that is my Buddhist name. There is a deep connection to all of the stories that I read in this uh, book. But there is one person, and it ends uh, with this, uh, Murakita, who buries, writes the Lotus Sutra on these stones, individual characters on these pebbles. And he buries this in a, I guess it's a 50 gallon drum, and buries it in Heart Mountain. And many years later, someone plowing the field discovers this and unearths this. And for a long time, they're selling <laughs> or giving away these uh, calligraphy, stones with calligraphy on it, until someone begins to put together what this is about. That it is a sutra that has been buried in the soil, literally, in the soil of America. We are, as Buddhists, kind of more recognized now with Zen Buddhism, with Nichiren Buddhism, Buddhism as a whole uh, being a part of our, I mean, you, you can look it up in the dictionary, you'll see Nirvana. I mean, who knew what Nirvana was 50 years ago? Now you can look in and Google it and you'll find, well, you don't have to Google it, you can look in a, Dictionary, paper, you know, one of those dictionary things, <laughs> and find these kinds of words that are central to Buddhist understanding. But there's a lot of work to be done. There are still people who we easily say, oh, I don't know who they are, so we can discard, disregard, place out of our thoughts. American Sutra, uh, I am no person to say how important this work is but I certainly appreciate the work that has been done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riman. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Gordon Smith. Uh, Gordon is head docent and member of the board of directors of the Japanese American Museum, Museum of San Jose. He's a public health graduate of the University of Hawaii. Came to San Jose with his wife, Gail, about five years ago after living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he worked at for the Sandia National Laboratories. Gordon's interest in the internment came late in his life when he started volunteering uh, at the museum. He and, he and his wife, Gail, live in the outskirts of Japantown, which they find to be a very vibrant and welcoming community full of Japanese-American history, culture, arts, and of course, Japanese restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Uh, let's see, I recognize some faces out in the audience. Uh, thank you for being here. For those of you that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I hope to meet you during refreshments afterwards. Uh, on behalf of the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, I would like to thank Dr. Williams for giving us this opportunity to co-sponsor his presentation and book signing. I also want to personally thank Dr. Williams because I found the book to be very eye-opening. It uh, presented a part of history that was unknown to me, and I've actually used it for the museum since now when I give uh, docent tours, I make sure I bring out how Buddhists were treated during the incarceration. I additionally also found that the book is also an excellent history of what happened prior to, during, and in the aftermath of the internment. And so I encourage all of you to read the book, not just for what happened to Buddhists, but also for that great history. Thank you, Dr. Williams. 
A uh, couple of passages in the book really kind of captured for me uh, some essence of the internment. One had to do with the gong at the Buddhist temple in Salinas. This really captured for me the beliefs, prejudice, fears, hysteria of the American public and the American government toward Buddhists and Japanese Americans. So at some great expense, the temple in Salinas was forced to remove their gong after the attack on Pearl Harbor because of this outrageous, ludicrous fear that somehow the gong could be rung and that would signal Japanese warships in Monterey Bay, which was 19 miles away. <laughs> I'm glad Dr. Williams spoke at some length about the passage about the lotus flower emerging from muddy waters. I in particular found that to be very moving. I thought it well captured the resilience, the uh, perseverance, the strength, and most of all the optimism of the Buddhists, particularly the Buddhist ministers who were in camp that even after this horrible experience, that something as beautiful as a lotus flower would emerge from that experience. And then lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, uh, my wife and I are from Hawaii. Uh, my wife's uh, grandfather, her only surviving one when I met her, uh, he had been very important as part of a Buddhist community in Honolulu. So consequently, he was one of the Buddhists that was shipped from Hawaii to the mainland, and he was in like three confinement sites. I always found him to be a very strong man. What I found remarkable, which I didn't know about until I read your book, was that the government tried to stamp out Buddhism in Hawaii after the war, tried to make it illegal. And despite what my wife's grandfather's experience through internment, he again became a very important member of the Buddhist community in Honolulu, and he went on to found and help build a new temple there. Thank you very much for that, and thank you from all of us for your amazing work. Thank you, Dr. Williams. <laughs>